Hi everyone, my name is Jen, I'm an author and a book reviewer, and I thought I would start a new reading vlog today. This one doesn't have a particular theme, but well, the theme is books I wanted to read today that I pulled off my shelves, and all of them happen to be quite short. So there we go, is that a theme? That can be the theme. Um, it's the end of January as I'm starting this video. I'm not sure when you're gonna see it. Um, I'm going in for another operation at the end of February, and last time that happened, I was sick for a whole month. So I'm trying to get a couple of extra bits done here and there to fill any blank spaces. But if I need to disappear from the internet, I will disappear because that kind of stuff can't be helped. But anyway, I like filming reading vlogs too, so why not? Um, so this is just a quick intro. Um, as I said, it's the end of January. Mr. M and I are going to a cottage in the woods for the weekend, which I'm really excited about. Just us and the woods and some deer and some books. So I'll show you what books I am taking with me. Um, and as I said, these are just ones that were calling to me today when I looked at my shelves. I'm not gonna talk you through the blurbs because I'm gonna chat about them in this video as I read them, but I will just hold them up and show them to you. Some of them are ones that I've hauled relatively recently. So we've got Ms. Ice Cream Sandwich by Miko Kawakami, which is translated from the Japanese by Louise Heel Kawai. Then we have got Voyager by Nona Fernandez, which is translated from the Spanish by Natasha Wimmer. Nearly all of these are translated, actually. We've got Chinatown by Tuang. This is translated from the Vietnamese by Win and Lee. We have Owlish by Dorothy Tse, which is translated from the Chinese by Natasha Bruce. And then we have this, which is not translated. This is Self-Portrait with Ghost by Meng Jin. And this cover is just amazing. So those are the books that I'm taking with me into the woods um, and I will take you on some walks and stuff and I may continue the vlog after we get back because we're only going for a couple of days. Do I need five books for a couple of days? Probably not but it's me you're talking to so, so what do you expect? All right I will check in with you in a bit. In the meantime here's some footage of something. I don't know what's about to happen. You will see. I will check in with you later. We're in the woods. We got here yesterday before it got dark, which you have seen, because we were able to go for a walk before sunset, which was really lovely. And then last night, I decided to curl up with my first book, which was Miss Ice Sandwich by Miko Kawakami, translated from the Japanese by Louise Heel Kawai. Now this was a bit, maybe not a strange choice for me, but one I was apprehensive to read because I've read two of her books before. I, well, I tried Breast and Eggs and I didn't get on with it very much. And then I read Heaven when it was shortlisted, longlisted for the Booker International last year. And I found it a bit too neat, a bit too preachy in places. And the representation of disability was a bit weird. Kawakami has this habit of having a character lecture to another character and therefore to the audience almost with a moral lesson and I find that really patronising and annoying but, 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 I really love the sound of this book and I wanted to check it out and I am thrilled to say that I really enjoyed this book. I also have another one of hers, A Proof, is it All the Lovers in the Night? feel like I may have made that up, I don't remember. Anyway, I have that on my shelf too, and I plan to read that during a themed reading vlog where I read books by authors I'm giving another chance to. 
authors who I haven't enjoyed previously or maybe I've enjoyed some of their work and not others and this is going to be the deciding factor. But yeah, this one is really short. It's only 90 pages and it crams so much stuff in here. This is narrated by a young boy who's having a bit of a perplexing time at home. So his mum started this new job. It's quite spiritual. There's a lot of meditation involved. She's helping women who are in difficult circumstances. And the narrator doesn't really understand what the mum's doing and finds it a bit embarrassing. Also, his grandma is at home and she's dying and he's finding that obviously very difficult. At school he has a relationship with someone called Tutti but they're really friends outside of school, they don't talk very much at school. So the thing that really grounds and centres our narrator is that most days after school he'll go to the local shopping mall and he'll see this woman who he calls Miss Ice Sandwich making sandwiches and serving them to people and he takes great comfort in this repetitive motion. Her reliable presence is something that consoles him and distracts him from the things in his life that he's finding hard to deal with. I misread this and she's not making ice cream sandwiches, she's making just normal sandwiches and he calls her ice sandwich because she has this blue eyeshadow. There are themes in this that are in both Breasts and Eggs and Heaven. So cosmetic surgery is talked about because people at the narrator's school mock Miss Ice Sandwich. They say she has had botched plastic surgery and that they would die if they ever looked like her. And that's covered in Breasts and Eggs. And then also, like in Heaven, there's this element of um, hidden friendship and bullying that's talked about a lot too. But this is much more condensed and I found it much more effective in this book here. Something that the characters do, Tutti and the narrator, is they like to replay scenes. Tutti in particular likes to act out scenes from films that they've memorised by heart and do a play by play, play by play, which they're really good at. And this kind of mirrors this anxious behaviour of going over the same things in your head again and again, reclaiming that and giving agency to the characters performing their anxiety in a very deliberate way instead of letting it consume them. And I thought that was really great. There was one point towards the end of the book when Tutti did that thing that I don't like that Kawakami does, basically lecturing a narrator and telling them what's important in life. And I found that frustrating, but it was very short and I'm gonna ignore it, I'm gonna excuse it. So yeah, I'm really pleased that I enjoyed this book. So hooray for that. Um, I am gonna sit here now and start reading Chinatown by Tuan, which is translated from the Vietnamese by Win An Lee. And um, yeah, I'm gonna do that and have a cup of tea and I'll come back to you in a bit and talk to you about it. I was going to say it's going to seem like I haven't moved but that's because I haven't moved because I've been sitting here and reading but unfortunately I don't think this one is for me and I'm so gutted about this because I bought this recently and I adored the sound of it. It's about a woman who's on a metro and it's brought to a standstill because they've discovered a suspicious package. She's sitting on this metro with her son Vin and she starts thinking back on her life especially her relationship with a man called Twee and it's told in very stream of consciousness fashion and sometimes I love that and sometimes I don't but this is what it looks like on the inside. There are no paragraphs and the thoughts bleed into each other. It's like you're being plonked down in someone's mind and you're watching them jump between memory and memory with no narrative over the top. There's no voice to contextualise things for you. You are just thrown in at the deep end. And sometimes I like that in books and I like being lost at the beginning of a book and then finding my footing and gradually collecting context. But sometimes that can be frustrating too and I'm definitely finding it more frustrating. I read the first 50 pages and I felt like it was boggling my brain and I thought, no, I really, really, really want to get to grips with this book. So I went back to the beginning and I read the first 50 pages again and it is just not for me at all and this makes me really sad. I'm going to tell you who I would recommend this book to. I would recommend this book to fans of Milkman by Anna Burns. I had exactly the same issue with this book. The writing style and the way that the memories bled together and the way the language ran into each other was just something I couldn't get to grips with 
at all. So I know that Milkman was a very Marmite book. If you are one of the people who love that book, I think that you would really like this. And I'm just so sad that it's not my cup of tea. I'm not gonna berate myself for not getting on with it. You know, we can't love everything that we read, but I really thought I was gonna love this. I'm really sad about it. But onwards, Mr. M and I are gonna go for a walk. And so I will insert that here and then I'll come back to you to talk about another book later on. is matching this sofa here we have two more books to talk about one that I liked and one unfortunately that I didn't shall we begin with the one that I like because I didn't enjoy the last one either so this is a short story collection that I brought called self-portrait with ghosts and it's by Meng Jin I didn't love every single story in this book a lot of them are coming of age stories about family and disputes with friends and looking at in many cases grudges that can be held for a long period of time and how those morph without us really consciously thinking about them so maybe a character will encounter someone in their adult life that they had a very strong feeling about in their teenage years and they haven't confronted that feeling for a very long time and it feels very alien to have these teenage emotions as an adult that haven't evolved with the rest of you. I like that that jarring nature that occurred in several of the stories because of that. Um, some of them I thought were maybe a little bit as I said with Kawakami's writing, a bit too neatly brought together at the end, which I don't find very satisfying because it, it makes it feel more fictional than I would like it to. But there was one story in here that I absolutely loved and it's about a woman who's a nanny for a childhood friend and she has quite a complicated relationship with that friend because they were very competitive at school and she feels as though some of that competitiveness is still lingering especially because she's looking after her friend's kids so that she the friend can go out and have her career so in effect the narrator feels as though she's nurturing the friend and mothering her so that she can have certain things in her life that the narrator feels she's never going to be allowed to have herself almost like her friend has grown up in a way that she hasn't and she has this resentment that she doesn't want to explore too much because she feels a bit guilty about it but then she meets this man who wants to see her during the week but during the week she's looking after the baby and the man says to her well why don't you just leave the baby one time and come and meet me so she's trying to persuade herself that that would be an okay thing to do and I thought the tension in that was really strong I would have liked to have read a whole novel about that not that all short stories should be novels 
I, I fundamentally disagree with that as a short story writer myself. I'm just saying I enjoyed spending time in that very tense, uncomfortable atmosphere and would be willing to spend more time there if permitted. But as a short story, I thought that it worked beautifully and it ended at a point which didn't give us any answers, which I also enjoyed very much. Others may find that infuriating, but I, I did not. But the other book that um, I've decided is not for me is Owlish by Dorothy Sir. This is set in an alternate Hong Kong where there are magical things that are happening. There is a land called the Land of Nevers and it's very heavily inspired by E.T.A. Hoffman and I have read quite a few books that use him as a jumping off point. He is the author of um, Capelia and the Nutcracker and this reminded me a lot of Angela Carter's work. I still have yet to finish The Infernal Desires of Dr. Hoffman but that is about a doctor who falls in love with a woman made of glass and that's also what happens in this book and I was also reminded of Clara and the Sun by Kazuo Ishiguro which is a book that takes a lot of inspiration from Hoffman as well and I love themes of humanity and what makes us human and I also love creepy stories about dolls so you would think that I would like this book which is about a man called Q who collects dolls and falls in love with one of them who is made out of glass but the writing style unfortunately wasn't for me. Sometimes the narration is really matter of fact and I enjoyed it when it felt as though the speaker was getting close to you and whispering in your ear. In truth, we already know Professor Q's fate. He is going to fall in love with the beautiful doll named Alice. He might have been a little slow on the uptake, reluctant to admit it even to himself, but the signs had been there all along since well before he turned 50 and officially embarked on the affair. So I like that, but then it switches between that and holding you at a distance and trying to spin these magical scenarios about this land that's kind of difficult to pick Picture. And in many ways I think that reading other books inspired by Hoffman would mean that I would like this because I love intertextuality. However, because I have read plenty of books inspired by Hoffman that have captivated me much quicker and to a greater extent, I think this means that I'm enjoying it less than if this had been the first book that I had read which used Hoffman's fairy tales as a starting point. I am just comparing it to all the other books that I've read on this subject and this one is coming up short. So I think I am going to pass this one on to someone else and just admit that this one is not for me, which is a shame. But I also picked up another book, a sixth book, before heading out the door to come here. I decided I would just pack a crime thriller because I thought maybe I would be in the mood. And the one that I decided to bring was I Let You Go by Claire McIntosh. So very different to everything else that I've been reading, but I think I'm going to head there next. So I'm gonna read this and then I'll report back. Good morning. It's Sunday, it's our final day here and I'm uh, all wrapped up, cosy and warm and I'm here to talk to you about I Let You Go by Claire McIntosh. I picked this one up last night and I raced through it and I finished it this morning. This did the rounds when it came out. When did this come out? Let me see. 2014. So it's been a while since this one came out, eight years. So this was definitely one that had a girl on the train moment where everyone was reading it and um, I didn't pick it up back then. I think I wasn't reading as much crime at that point in time. I I enjoyed this book. I'll always remember this thing that Mercedes said once, and if you don't follow Mercedes, I'll link her down below, but she said that sometimes she reads a book and it feels like eating sweets and it's really sugary and it's Moorish and you just want to keep on eating it and then you get to the end and you realise that it wasn't actually that satisfying and you maybe regret it a little bit. <laughs> um, but sometimes books are like that. Now I don't regret reading this book at all but I think there was definitely an element of that of I just need to know what happens but if I think about the way that the story was executed it probably wasn't as developed in some respects as I would have liked it to have been. So this is about a woman called Jenna and she is running away from a situation and she's running away to Wales and she leaves everything behind and she sets up life in a caravan site. 
Then we're following a detective who is trying to solve the mystery of the person who did this hit and run. Claire McIntosh used to be a police officer and you can tell that when you're reading this book and my favourite bits of this book were the bits following the detectives because I felt as though that was the most realistic, that the parts that were most believable and brought to life in a way that I could imagine everything. Whereas Jenna's sections, some of it was a bit far-fetched. I felt some of it really wasn't and was very hard hitting, but there were parts where I just thought, wait, how did you do that? And how has no one found you? There were a few too many gaps in her story that I couldn't dismiss as just, oh, I'm, I'm sure there's an explanation. It, it was bugging me, you know? I would love to read another Claire McIntosh book if she's written something that is more focused on the police force or on a regular person being a sleuth and trying to solve a crime because that's my favorite kind of crime thriller. I would compare this book to Nikki French books that I haven't loved as much where an abusive relationship is at the center. So content warning for abusive relationships and sexual assault in this book here um i think that that is a subject matter that i tend not to enjoy as much i know you're not supposed to enjoy it it's not a theme in a book that i would purposefully gravitate towards and books like nikki french's secret smile would fall into this category when i did my ranking of all nikki french books all the books that are about abusive relationships were right at the bottom of the pile. It's just not something that I tend to get on with as much, so that's probably going to be a factor that affected my enjoyment of this one here too. I liked this book. I obviously raced through it really quickly. I really wanted to know what happened. There was a twist at the end, like an extra one, that I wasn't sure needed to be there. It was one of those extra twists that felt as though it was there for the sake of shocking you one final time, but I wasn't sure I could get behind it or believe it holy. <laughs> would I reread it? No. Did the book achieve what it set out to achieve for the most part? I would say yeah. So those are my thoughts on this book. We are going to go for a walk by the coast and then drive back home. So I will see you when we are back in London and I will read Voyager by Nona Fernandez, which means that I'll have read all of the books that I brought down with me. So um, I will see you, well here's the sea, and I will see you back home. We are back home now and I have read Voyager by Nona Fernandez, which is translated from the Spanish by uh, Natasha Wimmer. Oh, this isn't focused. Let me focus so that it's not annoying you by going in and out of focus all the time. I can't remember if I said what this was, was about at the beginning. I know that I've recently included this finished copy in a haul video, but this is part memoir. If I had to compare it to another author, I think I would compare her writing to Maggie Nelson. It's kind of doing a deep dive into a particular area of non-fiction, a specialist subject, whilst also using it, holding it up as a mirror to your own life and playing around with imagery, metaphor, extended metaphor, to get to grips with something personal in a more detached way. I think, that, I think that makes sense. I think I'm gonna, I'm gonna keep that explanation in. So she's looking at constellations and stars. If you've read Alan Lightman's work, then I think that you would enjoy this as well. And I think there's a lot of beautiful comparison going on here. Um, here, for instance, is an example of that. There are more than 100 stars in the constellation of Cancer, only 50 of them visible. The brightest of all is Al Taf, an orange giant 500 times brighter than the sun, and 200 light years from our solar system. My brain can't fathom exactly what that means, but I understand that its light departed a long, long time ago, making an endless voyage from the past to twinkle here over my head. What I see in the night sky, when I can see anything at all, is a bright postcard of a moment that has ceased to exist 
but lives on in the glow, like my mother's memory of the moment I was born. So there are beautiful parts like that. I do think that maybe reaching for star imagery, black holes relating to memory, feels a little too easy sometimes and can kind of traipse into the cliche a bit. Or maybe I've just read a few books that feel a bit similar, um, Constellations by Sinead Gleason, in a way Sight by Jessie Greengrass, that secular, you know, woman becoming a mother, thinking about her own mother, thinking about her child, this linking. I've read quite a few memoirs like that. I thought maybe the most powerful bits of this book, probably because I've read other ones that are similar, where she zoomed out and then talked about the political situation in Chile and how even when her son was older and at school, he wasn't allowed to speak out against anything that he considered to be right wing. And if you spoke out against anything that was widely regarded as oppressive, teachers used this excuse by saying that you weren't being balanced enough and that you had to be more balanced, but that just meant silencing yourself. You know, there's a beautiful sentence towards the end of this book, which says, a piece of sky can be a library too. Like someone somewhere, even if it's just a universe, is watching. And you should always try and express yourself as much as you possibly can. But if you can't, if you are being silenced, something is witnessing it somewhere. That's poignant, but also verging on, as I said, the uh, earnest. And I get frustrated with writing like that. Like on the page opposite, it says a book is a space time capsule. It freezes the present and launches it into tomorrow as a message. And yes, that's true. And yes, we're all made of stardust and all of that stuff. But maybe I'm just too much of a cynical person. If that is hammered home again and again and again in a book, I get a tad frustrated. So if you're less cynical than me, then I think that you would really like this book. And as I said, I think if you've enjoyed Sinead Gleason, Maggie Nelson, Jessie Greengrass in the past, then I think you might want to check this one out too. Thank you very much for joining me for this vlog. I would love to know if you have read any of these books or if you would like to check them out now that I've talked about them. I'm still gutted that I didn't enjoy Chinatown. I, I still want to go back and give it a third try but I know I'm still not gonna like it. I just had such high hopes, but sometimes life is like that, but that's fine. If you enjoyed this video and you're new to my channel and you would like to subscribe, that'd be lovely. If you like my content and you would like to consider supporting me on Patreon, that'd be very kind. Link to that is in the description box too. Support over there allows me to continue to create free content for everyone here. And it also funds my time to make everything accessible by making captions and all of that good stuff. I'm sending lots of love to you all and I'll see you for another video next week. Bye.